All right, as people are moseying in, come on down, have a seat. We will get ramped up and started. We have fun things today. And um, how about those Cubs? Cubs, yeah. What, Cubs? There was a ball game last night. Oh, oh, Astros. Astros. Oh, Astros. Okay. Is Greg Johnson here? Because Greg was complaining yesterday because he... There you are. Can you speak? Barely. Oh, were you yelling at your TV again? Yesterday, Greg was down here in his all horse and everything, and he said, you have to apologize. I have to apologize because I yelled at my TV all last night. He... Uh, he was an Astros fan last night. I guess he's still an Astros fan today. And the night before when he, they lost, it was a little difficult on a few people. So, uh, second day of the conference. Had a lot of fun yesterday. Had a lot of interesting things uh, that we went through. I promise to give you all a, a few observations today. Uh, we'll give you at least one or two of them. Eat the mic and cell phones obsolete and Battlestar Galactica, but the first Im Im important one is eat the mic. We had a little difficulty with some of the panels yesterday. It was, uh, they were very relaxed. And as they were very relaxed, they sat back and relaxed even more. And our audio guys had the volume, the gain on the mics turned all the way up to the point where they were almost getting feedback. So panelists, please be very close to your microphones or at least don't lean back away from your microphones as you speak today. That way we'll be able to uh, hear everybody appropriately. So in beginning today, we've got uh, Jan Davis. Uh, Jan is uh, well known in the Huntsville area. Jan is the program manager for, manager for Bastion Technologies here. She uh, three, flew on three space shuttle flights with 670 hours as a mission specialist. And since then, she's worked in multiple areas in NASA including the director of the Human Exploration and Development of Space Independent Assurance Office, director of Flight Projects Directorate at Marshall, and director of Safety and Mission Assurance at Marshall. So, Jan. Thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate the invitation to speak here. This is a wonderful symposium. Uh, of course, growing up in Huntsville, I'm very familiar with Dr. Von Brown and went to school with his kids. And so his, uh, his widow and three kids and their families came to my last launch. So it's very special to me, that family. And the fact that we've named this symposium and the dinner tonight after him is uh, indeed a great honor for them. So uh, what I'm going to, could I have the first slide, please? Or I have the clicker? Okay. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is safety and mission assurance in human space flight. And uh, what, it's really not limited to safety and mission assurance in human space flight. We're talking about the whole system of engineering, safety, program management, and how they're all related. And, and um, so what we're going to talk about uh, is in memory of the folks who have lost their lives in human space flight, not just these two crews, also Apollo 1. There are other uh, astronauts who have lost their lives. And I was a part of return to flight for both of these crews. I started with NASA as an engineer and uh, worked in design, stress analysis, and testing of the Hubble Space Telescope when I came to Marshall. And then after the Challenger accident, I was uh, named the lead for the redesign of the aft ET attach ring, which attaches the boosters to the external tank. So very involved with that return to flight for Challenger. Uh, after Challenger, I was in the first astronaut group that was selected in 1987 after the Challenger accident. So lived through that return to flight, how we made uh, things better from a safety and um, engineering and programmatic standpoint. And so I'm going to talk about sort of that evolution and uh, what my involvement was at that time for Challenger. So after I retired from the astronaut office, I uh, moved back to Marshall and headed up these organizations you talked about. Uh, you heard about, one of which was the Human Exploration Development of Space Independent Assurance, which was out of headquarters. So we did a lot of the same kind of work that NESC does, independent assessments for shuttle and station 
again, for safety of flight. Uh, after leading the group for uh, International Space Station at Marshall, uh, Columbia happened. And so then I was uh, asked to be the head of safety mission assurance at Marshall. Again, returned to flight, worked very closely with Brian O'Connor, uh, who was head of safety mission assurance at headquarters for the establishment of the independent technical authority. So I'm, I'm going to talk um, about those things, uh, not only the evolution of SNMA and human spaceflight at NASA, but also uh, what we can learn from Columbia and Challenger. That in itself we could spend all morning talking about, so I'm just going to briefly touch on that. Uh, and then the lessons learned, especially about uh, safety mission assurance and engineering being an independent technical authority, as well as some of the other things we've learned from those uh, accidents, um, how, we, how we're applying those currently to current programs, and then what we need to think about uh, in applying those also for future spaceflight programs. So back in 1967, of course, uh, we know about the fire on the test stand for Apollo 1, and um, this was a flight scheduled for February 21st. The accident happened on January 27, when we, we lost three lives in that accident. And at that time, safety mission assurance was part of engineering. So safety mission assurance was actually like a systems engineering type discipline uh, embedded in engineering. And so uh, in investigating these accidents, of course, they had the physical causes, the engineering causes of the uh, electric arc and a power cable in the ecosystem. But also, just as in the other accidents we've had, they look at the organizational causes and what we can do from that standpoint and the culture standpoint. And so uh, they felt organizationally that there was some overconfidence because of all of the successes that they've had. And if you remember back in the 60s, those of you who are, were there in the 60s, <laughs> we have some young folks who may not be aware of the, all of the flights that we had and the flight rate that we had to get to the moon. And so we were on a very fast pace. And so um, as a result of this accident, they split out uh, what they call then SRQ&A, Safety, Reliability, Quality Assurance, uh, at the different centers and made them independent of the projects. And they reported directly to the center director. So that happened as a result of this accident. Um, then in 1986, the Challenger accident, um, Again, we're familiar with that, the, the physical causes, the O-ring and the solid rocket booster, as well as the cultural and organizational uh, atmosphere that, that led to that disaster. At the time, safety and mission assurance was funded directly by the program. Uh, so they were still a separate office, but the funding came directly from the program. There was not independent funding. And so um, one of the outcomes of, of this accident of Challenger, not only, um, and I remember, you know, what we talked about, the normalization of deviance and how we got to this point, again, uh, being complacent with uh, prior successes that led to uh, um, some other things with the design of the, the solid rocket booster O-ring area. So we, I think we're all familiar with that um, physical cause, but from the safety and mission assurance standpoint, we actually stood up the Office of Safety and Mission Assurance at headquarters, and the funding for the safety and mission assurance organizations at the very various centers came from headquarters, and it was, uh, it was called ETB, um, another uh, acronym I can't remember, Engineering Technical Base. Uh, so ETB funds were used to fund the safety and mission assurance as a result of, of what happened in the Challenger accident. We had Columbia in 2003, um, and uh, again, some uh, organizational and cultural things that led to that in addition to um, the physical cause of the foam coming off of the tank. And so we have, in my opinion, since that accident, really incorporated a lot of lessons that we learned from the things from an organizational, programmatic, safety, and engineering standpoint uh, that, that we learned not only from the Columbia Accident Investigation Board report, but also um, from, from a lot of other things that we learned as a result of this accident. And this, this is the one I'm most familiar with because after this accident was when I became 
head of safety and mission assurance at Marshall, leading uh, to a successful return to flight. So in this case, from an organizational standpoint for safety and mission assurance, um, before Columbia, funding went away from this independent uh, funding source at headquarters and came back to the programs. And um, even though organizationally we had a separate safety and mission assurance organization, which we changed the name after Challenger from SRQA to SNMA, now SMA, um, we um, we weren't complete, SMA was not completely independent because the funding was still coming from the programs. And so that's where we uh, um, emphasize the independent technical authority as well as the focus on safety being independent, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a minute. So don't you love uh, charts that you can't read? <laughs> so don't worry about reading this chart, but it is, look at the gray shapes that's what I want you to focus on. And so this is a, a great uh, report that Scott Johnson did in 2012. This is a chart where he charted, and it's a subjective chart, but on the left axis, it's the um, effectiveness of the safety and mission assurance organization. So we had uh, this leading up to Challenger, and then, uh, excuse me, this leading up to Challenger and then Columbia. So, you know, the effectiveness of SNMA um, prior to Challenger had gone down. And then um, again, after Columbia, excuse me, yeah, here's the line for Columbia, I apologize. Again, the effectiveness, we increased it after uh, an accident and then slowly uh, the effectiveness went down due to a number of things which we'll talk about. And so uh, we, we made those changes after Columbia, uh, which hopefully it's not a downward slope, hopefully it's, it's a level slope uh, where, uh, or increasing, at least uh, not decreasing. So there are several things in the words here that talk about how we can make sure that we keep that effectiveness constant and not decline. And so uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about in a few, few more slides. Just a little bit more, um, uh, granularity to the slide, but uh, I think you get the idea of, of the trends that, um, you know, if we're not careful, the effect, effectiveness and the safety of these programs can decline if, we, if we're not vigilant and, and stay on top of uh, their involvement. And we don't want another accident to help us to learn those lessons uh, or help us revisit uh, those lessons that we should have learned. Just the second part of, of that slide. So um, this slide, basically, as I mentioned, Challenger and Columbia, uh, we learned a lot about engineering, about program management, about normalization of deviance, groupthink, uh, and I don't normally read from slides, but I'm gonna just read these, not gonna want to discuss them. It's a compilation of things that I've learned just from my experience with two returns to flight and my work in the safety organizations but also Wayne Hale, who I actually saw earlier this week, um, Terry Wilcutt, there are a lot of common themes we all uh, have learned from that. And it's just a good reminder to um, beware of this normalization of deviance that just because something is successful over several flights or maybe it's a little bit you know, off nominal, you know, the hardware didn't do exactly what you wanted it to, uh, but it's okay because nothing happened and we eventually get to a point where we're accepting things we shouldn't accept. And then um, provide organization uh, and culture, provide an organization culture where dissenting opinions can be heard. Uh, listen to the hardware, it talks to you and be wary of how data can be misused or misrepresented, which happened uh, at Columbia and, and uh, Challenger both. Uh, and you're not as smart as you think you are. Um, it happens to all of us. You know, I was in the FRRs for Columbia, and, uh, you know, I, I wasn't smart enough to, to see what was happening. And uh, so just, just be aware of that. You have to stay vigilant. You have to keep aware of these things when, when uh, things are not necessarily exactly as designed or as uh, should be um, behaving. Keep safety programs independent from the programs they evaluate. I'm gonna show you how we're doing that currently. 
and employ a, a rigorous systems engineering process from an engineering and from a safety standpoint, from an integrated hazard standpoint, as well as uh, systems engineering and integration. It's critical to know how something that happens in one part of your vehicle may affect uh, something else in the rest of your vehicle. And I don't want to hit this because <laughs> this is our next big vehicle, but you know, we definitely are doing this um, here at Marshall for SLS, and I know the cross-program integration, integrating Orion, GSDO, and SLS. So that systems engineering and integration is critical. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's talk a little bit about what we learned from Columbia and Challenger and how it applies to uh, the current programs, from a, especially from a human uh, spaceflight safety standpoint, but it also applies to the independence of engineering as well. So uh, this is the Engineering and Safety Mission Assurance Technical Authority uh, structure, and uh, this is focused on Marshall. This, since I'm uh, Safety and Mission Assurance at Marshall from a contractor standpoint, uh, this is uh, what I have at Marshall, but uh, it's similar other places. So if you look at the left, the gray boxes, um, we have chief safety officers for each element of, of uh, the SLS. So for example, uh, you know, we have an avionics, software, booster, all the different elements, spy, um, that have their own independent safety and mission assurance chief safety officer, and they report to the director of safety and mission assurance. The, um, um, the program CSO, the SLS CSO, uh, also reports to the director of safety and mission assurance. He resides uh, with the program and you know, constantly is uh, interacting with the program, but um, administratively and from a supervisor standpoint reports to the director. So we also have CSOs for other programs, for example, International Space Station, so it's the same thing. Also on the right, you can see the chief engineers organization has similar structure where it's independent of the programs and projects. So the chief engineers report directly to their organization, the engineering director, and on up the chain at uh, headquarters, the uh, chief of the safety and mission assurance office, Terry Wilcutt, and the NASA chef engineer, Ralph Rowe. So they have a ind completely independent line, uh, both um, at the center and uh, throughout NASA. Uh, that's independent of the programs and projects, although they work obviously very closely with the programs and projects. So the, the basis for the tech excellence that we have on our programs and projects um, is upheld with these technical authorities. So we have the safety and mission insurance, the engineering, we have also uh, health and medical independent technical authority, and, and then the programs and projects have their authority. So it's, it's the job of the engineering safety chief medical officer uh, to um, point out things that we need to do in these programs and projects and categorize the risk that uh, is incumbent on the different decisions that are being made. And then in quantifying and uh, talking about the risk, then the program and project managers can make their assessment of whether to mitigate the risk, accept the risk, or uh, what course of action they, they should take. So it's, it's a partnership. That's why I said I'm not just talking about safety and mission assurance. That's just one pillar here. Um, all of these are necessary for successful programs, and that's the NASA governance for, for these programs. So uh, that's how we build mission success with these pillars. And uh, you can read this here out of NPD, the NASA policy directive, um, as to how we are committed, we NASA and the NASA team are committed uh, for the safety and health and the success of our missions. We also, as a result of uh, especially the Columbia accident, came up with a dissenting opinion process. So certainly um, we have uh, a culture where people can speak up. Uh, some people uh, may be reluctant to speak up, and they, but they don't agree with the decisions that are made, or people who did speak up and they uh, are, are still um, not happy with the decision and they feel strongly that they need to present this as a dissenting opinion. There is a process for that. 
So again, this is the process at Marshall. The uh, Safety Mission Assurance Council uh, meets weekly and discusses these dissenting opinions. And rather than go through all of the steps, uh, I'll just say that uh, it has been utilized in uh, International Space Station. It went all the way up to the Office of uh, Safety Mission Assurance at headquarters. And so there, there is an avenue that's uh, encouraged and supported and utilized. So I think this is uh, another great way to keep safety and, and mission assurance engineer. Anyone can use this dissenting opinion process and, uh, and keep it independent. And of course, no retribution or any um, problems with, with going through this process. It's been exercised and, and it's been successful. So in talking about future human spaceflight programs and what, what we can do, we, we know what we're doing currently. We need to keep those systems uh, um, going and, and, and utilize the ITA as well as the independent technical authority as well as the dissension, dissenting opinion process. And these, again, came from Scott Johnson's report. This is what was in the small print on those charts some of what was in the small print, but I thought they were really good. I couldn't say it better myself, and this is the way I feel, so I, I'm using uh, their words that uh, for future programs as well as current programs, we need to make sure that we have this culture where we have cooperation between organizations, meaning between safety, engineering, uh, the program manager. We have to constantly be communicating and cooperating. Uh, safety needs to be involved early, in a program and project to, to add the most value and uh, not be a role compliance. We have to have requirements met. That is the compliance part. But we also have to have sound engineering trades and understand that if you have too many checks and balances, which we did for a while, and we had to decide, you know, okay, what is reasonable in, uh, in flying in space. And so we have to make those trades based on sound engineering judgment. And I'm counting safety and mission insurance as part of that I mean, they're an engineering organization as well. So we all have to make those risk trades and provide that information to the projects and programs. Again, safety needs to be involved early and often, I should say, um, to be effective and also to provide the real-time or near real-time operations when we're flying. You know, when we're flying in space and uh, decisions need to be made while folks are in space, um, the safety and engineering organizations need to... Uh, to provide that support. Products have become more sophisticated over the years, much more so than when I was first involved with safety, the risk assessment tools, the uh, probabilistic risk assessment, the, the other products are more sophisticated, more quantifiable, and help um, assess the risk and, and um, you know, qualitatively and quantitatively communicate that risk to the programs and projects so they can make their decisions that they need to make. So for, again, for future pro programs, and this is based a lot on what I've already talked about, and I've seen this myself, and the CABE report, the Rogers Commission report, other things you may read will tell you that these are the kinds of things that we need to watch out for both, and we're at the perfect time now with uh, getting ready to fly SLS, but also future programs, you have to watch these things to make because they're insidious uh, to make sure that we don't, uh, you know, go back on that curve of effectiveness of safety emission assurance on the downward slope but to keep it constant. Uh, watching out for budget trends, staffing. Uh, we certainly need to um, uh, justify and be value added for the staffing and budget that we need, but it, it shouldn't just go down just because. Um, it needs to go down. So we need to be vigilant about that. Uh, personnel turnover, we need to keep our critical skill capability um, in all of the organizations, engineering, safety, and, and uh, the development of, of uh, program managers for future programs. Anomaly trends and close calls, this has bitten us in the past. We just need to uh, watch that and now we're uh, testing hardware and software and you know, we just need to watch that, uh, the close calls, the trends. If things aren't doing what they're designed to do, we need to, you know, be, be very vigilant about that, and I believe we are. And we have a rigorous process, independent process, as well as in-line process 
to do that. The use of the dissenting opinion process is very effective and uh, provides another avenue for people who really want to voice their concerns. Uh, reviewing of safety emission assurance products, we need to make sure we keep that. We can't drop off, okay, well, we don't really need that. You know, we need to make sure it's value added and necessary and not drop them just because um, we have a schedule pressure or budget pressure or whatever. Make sure we're doing it for the right reasons. Again, we need to keep developing uh, tools that are relevant and useful and quantifying both and, and qualitative assessments of risk um, for, for these human space flight programs. The open and multiple lines of communication, I'm really uh, glad to see this in uh, the program. Most, most of my work is SLS, some space station work, but there are open lines of communication between contractors, civil servants, engineering, safety, program, there's constant communication and I, I have, you know, employees who feel comfortable bringing up their opinions uh, even if they don't agree with, with what some other people feel. So uh, I think we have a good culture, but we just need to make sure we, we keep an eye on that, that people do feel comfortable uh, talking openly. And the integrity of the independent technical assessment uh, excuse me, authority for engineering and safety and mission assurance. This has been effectively used and uh, and so we need to make sure we, we keep that strong and keep the caliber of folks we have in these uh, CSO roles and uh, they're integral to the program and the projects and uh, I think the program managers rely heavily on them uh, for for that independent technical authority from a safety and engineering standpoint. So, in conclusion, I just want to say that we have, uh, you know, I don't mean to say everything's defined by the accidents, but in fact, if you look at the trend, as I said, the effectiveness of SNMA, we can look at those points and see how that effectiveness has changed um, and uh, evolved through, through those accidents and uh, lack of funding and reorganization, et cetera. But I believe we're in a good place now um, on all of those fronts, and we need to make sure we keep it that way. For, for our programs and projects. Uh, again, emphasizing involving safety mission assurance early and often. You know, by involving them early and in the design of the software or the hardware, that's when we can make the most effective changes without a, a big impact, rather than waiting until we're, we're post-CDR, DCR, and, and then make the changes. So by involving uh, the SNMA folks early, uh, we can make those changes early in the program with, with uh, less impact. And um, we continue, the safety and mission assurance organizations uh, can be effect, more effective by developing these uh, more sophisticated tools so that we can provide the program and project managers with ways to, to assess risk so that they can make the decisions on how they want to uh, handle that risk, either mitigate it or accept it or you know, uh, do, do something else to, to change what the level of that risk might be. Uh, another conclusion, the ITA has uh, really improved the visibility, technical competence, competence, and leadership within SNMA. I'm on the SLS SNMA Council even before I moved into my current job. Uh, and uh, that's been a, a great uh, that council, that SNMA, uh, S CSO council, has been a great way to encourage communication among co different contractors, both the hardware providers, service providers, uh, NASA, uh, all working together, uh, and we meet on a quarterly basis. So, that, But the independent technical authority lines that I showed you on the chart uh, is being used every day in the programs and projects and uh, has been a, a very positive thing, I think, for everyone. Descending opinion process and safety culture uh, provides a mechanism for people to, uh, to voice their opinions and also if, if their opinion has been voiced but they still would like to pursue their uh, descending opinion, then there's an avenue for that and, and that's been an effective process. NASA Safety Center, uh, and I didn't talk much about this, and other collaborative efforts, but uh, after Columbia, the NASA Safety Center 
became a repository for lessons learned and um, effective ways of, of uh, keeping um, information about lessons learned. You can go on there, it's online. Uh, the NASA.gov folks have a little bit more access to some of the, the information like the mishap investigation reports uh, and some other um, systems engineering, system safety type lessons learned, but they're, they are PowerPoint presentations that you can just pull out and show to your folks on what we can learn from past lessons. That's available on the NASA Safety Center website. And so that's been a great uh, tool for folks to have a repository where they can look at these reports and look at these lessons learned from uh, various incidents and accidents. So in conclusion, I uh, would like to show you this chart, which is uh, a summary of incident, significant incidents and close calls in human spaceflight. And I actually have these, this chart for you in a handout form that is out on the table in the front. I have some down here as well. Uh, this is online as well, but it's a very handy uh, tool just to look at uh, the different incidents, close calls, accidents, and look at these and remind ourselves what we can learn from, from these. This was put together uh, by the safety organization at Johnson Space Center, and um, I got it from the, uh, the NASA Safety Center. So this is a great uh, handout, which, as I said, are in the tables upstairs uh, just before you came in. I have some down here as well. And it's also available online, which is referenced here. Uh, and just as an example, you can manipulate uh, not manipulate, that doesn't sound right, but um, edit <laughs> the, uh, the way this is displayed. For example, this is just space shuttle. So you can, you can um, online look at it in different ways by um, having it online and having the capability to edit it. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. I just want to encourage you uh, to continue to communicate and, uh, and talk about how we can make human space flight safe and how we can make it safer. And of course, for the vehicle we're building now, future programs and projects, we just need to remain vigilant. And uh, as long as I'm able, I'm, I'm going to keep talking about this. And uh, I think all of our, the folks in our industry need to hear uh, the lessons that we've learned. And we need to share that with, with this generation and the next generation. Thank you very much. So I just want to say that um, Jan Davis is probably um, more um, responsible for me changing my attitude as a NASA project manager on changing from safety as a policing responsibility to a part of the team from the get-go. So young people out there, as you move into that management position, I want you to absorb what she has said and bring that to attention. So I'm going to transition to our next panel uh, panelist. If you'll come on down and start taking your spot. Um, and for the rest of you, good morning. Okay, so that's kind of like an Andy Griffith good morning. Hello, dear. Hello, honey. So, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, our next panel is going to be talking about Next Step. And you know NASA loves a good acronym, and sometimes they actually make sense. This one does. It's the Next Space Technologies for Exploration Partnership, Next Step. Let me put my glasses on. Our moderator for this session is Jason Cruzan. Jason and I have shared some uh, stages uh, in the past as um, strategy, dreamers, whatnot, and he continues to do that and push the, push the boundaries. But Jason is director of the Advanced Exploration Systems Division, Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA. Uh, in this role, he is NASA's senior executive advisor and advocate on technology and innovation approaches leading to new flight and system capabilities for human exploration of space. Manages over 450 civil servant employees, 150 on-site contractors, a portfolio of 20 to 30 technology projects, and that's why I keep bumping into him. Everything uh, there's a technology Jason is, is, is a part of. Jason, I appreciate you coming, and uh, we'll let you get started with your panel. Thank you.
Oh, thanks, Chris. So um, we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel we have today, um, and then also then after that give them a chance to give you guys an update of where they're at on their thoughts on work on their next step. Um, and then we're going to open up for a question and answer session. And mainly I would like to see a lot of questions coming from you guys in the audience as well. We have some up here, but I'm sure your questions are, um, will be much more entertaining for all of us this morning. So um, with that, um, we, we're, I'm joined today by all of our uh, team members on the next step except for Bigelow. They were unfortunately able, not able to make it today, but um, the rest of the um, uh, partners are here today. So first off, to my left here is John Goff. He's uh, on the Ixion team. Um, he's a senior t uh, space technologist, inventor, and entrepreneur, and the president and CEO of Altius Space Systems, uh, Space Machines. Uh, it's a Colorado-based uh, robotics and satellite servicing startup. Uh, John is uh, leading the Altius team that is supporting NanoRacks um, on the Exxon Next Step uh, habitation development efforts. And prior to the founding Altius, uh, John was a uh, previous co-founder and lead propulsion engineer for Mastin uh, of Mojave. Um, to his left is uh, Bob Richards um, from Orbital ATK. He is responsible for strategy and business development for the Advanced uh, Programs Division, including civilian space, human spaceflight, and space logistics business areas. Orbital ATK's human spaceflight activities include the cargo resupply services for the ISS, as well as future exploration services in cislunar space, space logistics, including new satellite servicing concepts and advanced uh, satellite systems. So thanks, Bob. Um, to his left is Mark Ortiz. Mark is here from Boeing. Mark is the program manager for Boeing's next step uh, work focused on habitation systems, mission architectures, international cooperation, and commercialization. In this role, Mark is leveraging innovations and capabilities from across Boeing in developing concepts to extend human presence into deep space. Prior to this, Mark served as a development leader for the International Docking Adapter, uh, NASA's docking system, and numerous other development projects to enhance ISS. To his left is Bill Pratt uh, from Lockheed Martin. Um, he works in the Advanced Human Spaceflight Programs at Lockheed. Bill has been working on numerous programs, including ATLAS, um, launch vehicle, Iconos uh, imaging satellites, reusable launch vehicles, human piloted spacecraft, such as Orion. And he's currently the Next Step uh, Deep Space uh, Habitat Program Manager, focusing on NASA to identify, study, and advance capabilities needed for humans into deep space. To his left and final is uh, Steve Lindsay. He joins us from Sierra Nevada Corporation. Steve is uh, Obviously a former Air Force pilot and NASA astronaut with more than 30 years of flight test experience. He's the Vice President of Space Exploration Systems at SNC, overseeing the design, development, testing, and operational employment of, Gene, of the Dream Chaser spacecraft. Um, he's also responsible the, the, for the, all the development of Dream Chaser-derived systems and products as well. So thank you guys for joining me today. Um, and where I'm going to start off with, is giving you guys a little bit of overview of, about Next Step in general. Um, so, many folks have seen this kind of chart of our progression of expansion of human spaceflight um, into cislunar space and then outward towards Mars. One of the key things that's happening is the way we do go about designing all these systems on long, long time scales is fundamentally changing. Um, the way we formulate programs, the way we work with industry, the industrial economy is, is changing as we're making this natural progression. So. In recognition of that, we are trying to balance a whole set of principles, our strategic principles for human spaceflight or sustainable human spaceflight. And you'll see that we're basically trying to solve for an eight variable problem simultaneously. And in our principles here, we have everything from fiscal reason, realism to continuation of human spaceflight um, to how to on ramp next generation technology and scientific findings. Um, this is a very complex problem in order to create a human in a sustainable human spaceflight program over a multi-decade period, um, which then requires a different tool set or a different engagement strategy uh, with industry, I would argue. Um, so as we're developing concepts like the Deep Space Gateway and the Deep Space Transport, there are traditional ways to do that. Uh, designing requirements, setting requirements, having companies um, enter into contracts with us and actually um, just go build it. Um, Another approach is how do we look at what industry is doing, the technical capabilities they're advancing, the commercial market potential as things are opening up. And first, before stepping into requirements, step back first and work with companies and say, how would, how would we leverage all those different activities? How best to go and achieve the exploration goal that the nation has, while at the same time advancing commercial capabilities and needs uh, as well? 
And with Next Step, what we've been doing is exactly that. So Next Step, the habitation piece, the folks here at the table with me, are the ones that we get a lot of the news and press about. But in fact, we've been uh, putting out solicitations and activities in many other discipline areas under Next Step as well. Everything from life support systems to advanced propulsion systems. We actually have a couple small satellites we're flying, uh, one with Lockheed Martin and one with Moorhead State University. Um, we're actually uh, looking at in situ resource utilization as another area. There's a whole host of discipline areas or capabilities we need that we believe there are other non-NASA mission applications for or ways that we can collaborate with industry in a different way. So at the core of this is a cost sharing model. Um, figuring out the right cost sharing model, though, is very, very tricky. And um, we have in this phase of work a, a specific cost sharing model. But every one of those examples I gave have a, had a different cost sharing model depending on the outside market demand for things. So as we're entering through these phases work on, that we're talking about today with habitation, um, we have six different partner organizations um, all represented up here. And they all have different approaches. They all have different business opportunities that they're chasing, um, uh, obviously with the exploration missions we have, but also outside of that. And what we're trying to do is maximize our approach to go enable or implement that vision of human spaceflight in a sustainable way through something like a gateway or other activities that we have, but get that right balance with us and, uh, and them working together. So in this phase, we've been asking companies to say, what is your best approach to implementing something like a gateway and transport? And that's what they're studying uh, with us today. Um, this will culminate um, in a year from now of actual physical hardware prototypes uh, being delivered um, across the country and being tested. Um, also development of common uh, interoperability standards, and maybe even human rating standards of things, um, and actually understanding how we plug together a complex human spaceflight endeavor um, into deep space. So with that, I'm going to turn over to each of uh, the panelists here to give you two or three slides on where they're at on their development activities, and then we'll enter into questions. So thank you. John? Excellent. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Jason. So um, as Jason was saying, I'm Jonathan Goff. I'm the president and CEO of a small uh, aerospace robotics uh, startup in Denver. We're supporting the Ixion development team uh, with Nanoracks, ULA, um, and SSL, um, MDA being the um, you know, primary partners on that. <clears throat> so um, one of the things we often see in aerospace is that uh, good ideas tend to bounce around for a while before they, before they finally gel and click. And the idea behind what Ixion is working on, and we're in a sort of, uh, as one of the previous slides indicated, we're in a concept study phase, um, is, you know, what's called a wet lab. I mean, uh, a lot of you here in Huntsville probably are familiar with the idea since it uh, originated, you know, with Skylab um, back in the day. <coughs> but the idea with the, you know, for those unfamiliar, the idea of a wet lab is that you have a, um, you know, you launch, uh, you know, you, you launch, uh, you know, rocket upper stage with a uh, small payload attached. And after you get into orbit, you know, that small payload, you know, is involved with opening up the upper stage and converting it into useful habitable space. <clears throat> um, you know, as I was saying, this is like one of the original concepts that uh, had been investigated for Skylab uh, back in the day. And uh, some of the key things that we're trying to do to make it, you know, more practical is working on how to do the outfitting uh, robotically you know, how to split the, you know, capabilities between the, you know, the mission module that launches with it and, you know, what goes into the tank. Um, and ultimately what we've been, you know, what we've been coming up with, uh, you know, I, th I think has a pretty exciting um, best of both worlds sort of uh, characteristic where it gives you a lot of the benefits that you would normally have with like an inflatable habitat of very large volumes that can be uh, reconfigured but also with the you know, mission module part that can be pre-outfitted on the ground. So you can have the hard stuff that you really don't want to be rearranging in space, like you know, uh, built and tested on the ground, but then still have all those benefits of you know, very large volumes. Um, you know, working with ULA on their, you know, we're working with them on versions of Ixion for Centaur 3, like shown in this picture, but also their, you know, advan their uh, enhanced Centaur or Centaur 5 uh, that they're working on right now. <clears throat> and with that, you know, we're, 
we're talking about um, you know, over 300 cubic meters of habitable space launched at once, where a good fraction of the mass is mass in the upper stage that you had to launch anyway um, to get to orbit in the first place. Um, and uh, one of the other neat things with some of the technologies that ULA is rolling out with their uh, you know, ACES stage and um, you know, the Zeus lander kit that my, old, uh, my former startup Mastin is working with them on, um, you know, will eventually make it so that you could deliver you know, affordable, habitable space pretty much anywhere in cislunar space, including the lunar surface. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, so Nanorax, you know, Nanorax is, you know, all about, you know, commercial, you know, commercial space uh, utilization. We're not, you know, what you'd normally consider a traditional aerospace, you know, contractor. Uh, Nanorax has done a lot about commercial util utilization on ISS, but they're also very interested in figuring out ways to do, you know, economically viable commercial space facilities, you know, both as expansions to ISS and, uh, you know, free flyers in low Earth orbit, you know, for various, you know, applications, everything from space tourism, assembling satellites, you know, microgravity manufacturing, if, uh, if any of those uh, things pan out, um, but also being able to support, you know, NASA missions such as, you know, Deep Space Gateway and uh, even lunar missions and beyond. Um, you know, in the context of the Deep Space Gateway, one of the nice, one of the interesting things about you know, Nanoracks being, you know, coming from a commercial angle is that, um, you know, ultimately, and going back to something Jason was saying, is that, you know, how you do a public-private partnership is really important. You know, in order for it to be a real successful public-private partnership, you know, you need to make sure that you set things up in a way where the product's still commercially viable, that it meets NASA's needs, but it still is actually commercially viable outside of NASA needs. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunities here um, you know, as part of the next step thing, uh, contracts were being asked to, um, you know, provide a vision that shows like how we could, you know, do a deep space gateway and deep space transportations. Um, but Nanorax is also, uh, you know, a very collaborative company. And so mm -hmm. one of the things we've been realizing is that, you know, one potential way of, you know, meeting that goal of striking the balance between a commercially viable space station that also, you know, meets all the needs that NASA has is, a more collaborative, um, you know, setup where we could be providing the, you know, expanded crew quarters and other capabilities and the volume uh, capabilities while partnering with, you know, uh, some of the other teams that, you know, for developing the more, you know, sophisticated, you know, hab and mission operations sort of capabilities. So uh, we'll be, you know, that's probably all I should say now to leave time for everybody else, but um, anyway, uh, that's, that's where Nanorax is at with Ixion. All right, good morning. Um, you know, Orbital ATK is very uh, excited to be part of this, uh, you know, NASA vision uh, for exploration. We've supported uh, NASA, of course, on many different uh, projects, and we think that this one in particular really uh, plays well to what we've done uh, with cargo resupply under COTS and CRS. And I think uh, we really have the right scale for this project. I mean, this is pretty uh, difficult stuff moving beyond uh, low, Earth, low Earth orbit. And throughout my career, which a significant part of it has been at uh, Orbital ATK, I've seen the company kind of go from a very entrepreneurial startup very uh, innovative, uh, you know, I ran uh, an early flagship product, uh, Pegasus, on the launch vehicle side, to kind of more of a medium-sized company where the scale is really helpful in, in addressing these uh, big, uh, you know, these big complex uh, space projects. Of course, we've gone through a merger with ATK, and that's uh, very important, and in fact, kind of first and foremost of our support of uh, exploration is being the prime contractor on the solid rocket boosters for the SLS. We're very uh, proud of that. And we've got, I guess, a little bit of increase in scale, even still ahead with the uh, um, uh, acquisition that's underway uh, by uh, Northrop Grumman. So this is a very important project to the company as a whole. Uh, I'm spending really a lot of my time on this and also other things we can do with Cygnus to increase the uh, capability of Cygnus to support science at the ISS, and then we see that kind of seamlessly moving to beyond low Earth orbit 
to uh, uh, cislunar space and the scientific activities that will occur out there uh, in around the uh, moon. So our, our approach to this type of project where we get to study, you know, under uh, Jason, the kind of system of systems, our approach is to start with flight demonstrated hardware that we've got in space. And our geostationary satellite um, programs, I guess we've got about 40 of them that are uh, flying, that, you know, gives us a uh, rad tolerant bus that's a 15 year lifetime and has demonstrated, uh, you know, a, kind of eight kilowatt uh, com package type of uh, capability over and over again. And then of course, we've got our Cygnus uh, product line. And <clears throat> the Cygnus product line, really we come at it from two directions that we want to leverage. One of them is the technical side where um, it's a uh, man rated uh, system. We've gone through the uh, JSC Safety Review Board that evaluates human rated uh, systems, but also from a business side. I think that's equally important for what NASA is trying to uh, do right now. And we were one of the um, sort of, a, I guess I would call it original successful uh, public private partnerships. Um, and we're very proud of, of making that work. And we'll probably talk about that some during the, the panel uh, itself. But um, so we, we really come at this uh, project from those two, uh, two positions. Um, you know, this kind of gives you a snapshot in time of uh, where we ended at the uh, phase one on the uh, upper picture. And some of our basic approaches, which have been touched on, you know, throughout this, uh, throughout this conference. So I'm not going to uh, really dwell on that. And, um, you know, in fact, I think really the best way to understand a, a vision of systems of systems is to kind of look at a, a video that I've got. So if you could cue that up, it'll really start from where we are today. You can go ahead and start it, which is a working Cygnus uh, product. Here's a Cygnus being uh, captured by the International Space Station. You can turn down the music just, just to hear there. And it's up and running. It's uh, flown successfully uh, eight times and really taken quite a bit of uh, cargo up to the International Space Station. But we're going to be evolving that, as I had said, to be uh, much more oriented towards science and carrying science up, even operating science within the module itself, much more of a free flyer. So this was sort of our vision on dates as far as how early could things uh, happen. So. You know, I wouldn't focus on that, but, you know, we've been looking at uh, modifying the Cygnus. It'll be uh, stretched and it'll have, it, it's really a derivative vehicle um, that can do uh, more things and also handle the uh, somewhat different environments of cislunar space. So this uses the uh, SLS-1B configuration, of course, and the co-manifest position to get the uh, uh, Cygnus derivative vehicle um, up to cislunar space. The Orion guides it, guides it in. And this could be uh, step one in a uh, cislunar mission. So after we've done uh, experiments in cislunar space, the Orion's gonna uh, leave and and take the astronauts back to uh, Earth. And then there'll be a, a follow-on set of uh, missions. And again, trying to capture this system of systems type of uh, thoughts. We really threw a lot of different things in this uh, video, which are sort of options. It could be, um, it, it could be a, a future. I'm sure things will, over time, get tweaked. In fact, under our phase two, we're already you know, looking at uh, things a little bit differently. Um, you know, NASA has provided a slightly updated reference mission, but we really feel like it's our, our job to provide some innovation, bring in some new ideas. So we're definitely not just, uh, you know, copying, I mean, that's too strong a word, but we're definitely not doing that to uh, the reference mission that, that NASA's got. 
Even uh, a year ago when we put this uh, video together, um, we had uh, envisioned that a, a pivot towards the moon was, was something that really seemed to make a lot of sense uh, to us. And, you know, this, this uh, concept here kind of sets up the framework for uh, doing that type of thing. We're very interested in um, landers, which could uh, be initial precursors to uh, surface activities. And we think the gateway is really a good place to start for that lander to be uh, based. And uh, we, we um, support companies like Astrobotics and Moon Express, and there's a couple others that are interested in doing that on a commercial uh, basis. And of course, the ultimate uh, destination is Mars. And this is a kind of notional view of what could a, a Mars uh, craft uh, make. But, you know, we're, as a company, we're much more focused on um, things that can happen in the near term. You know, um, the Mars stuff is, is kind of intellectually interesting, but it's pretty far out there. And our focus is to build things that are capable, safe, and, and near term, and do it hopefully under some pretty um, innovative business uh, relationships, et cetera. So we'll, we'll be exploring, uh, exploring all, all of that. So I think I'll stop there. And if you can bring back up the charts for, for the next uh, speaker. Okay. Let me get my mic on. Well, hey, thanks for the invite, Jason. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and talk with you about Next Step. This is really an exciting contract because it breaks ground not just in terms of an innovative contracting approach, but in challenging us all to think about the right technologies that will take us to the next uh, generation of human transportation systems. I also want to say how proud Boeing is to be taking these next steps with Boeing in doing the research that's needed to learn, to learn how to live and work for longer durations in space, much further from the Earth, and develop the solutions that will eventually take us to Mars. I wanted to go to a chart, if I can let's see. There we go. Jason showed a chart that depicted NASA's vision of the phases of exploration. And I think this is a nice uh, point to take a look at what our view of that uh, similar roadmap is. It really all starts with the International Space Station on the lower left. I think we all recognize the incredible engineering achievement that ISS is, has been for our nation and for nations of the world. It's also been a very safe and reliable human habitat and science laboratory for nearly 17 years. It's a great stepping stone to build from, and certainly in the years to come, ISS will serve as a, an important test bed to make sure that the technologies that we intend to use for these deep space vehicles have an opportunity to be proven out. We're doing that already on ISS. We have a number of uh, evaluations of deep space ECLOS technologies that will be brought online from a testbed standpoint in the year uh, ahead, um, and, and actually by the end of 2018. You know, this is an exciting opportunity to get runtime on these critical systems on a human platform that we have a lot of experience with. We can run these systems and collect data, compare them to our heritage systems in the ECLIS area, in the electrical power area, in the human interface area, um, multiple uh, areas where we need to gain additional knowledge and we need to learn about these systems from the standpoint of optimizing and refining these technologies. Across the top, uh, in the lunar vicinity, the Deep Space Gateway is shown. This is our concept of the gateway. But it, it is in cislunar space, uh, this proving ground, if you will, that the gateway will be assembled uh, as the first element of the exploration uh, mission scenario. Uh, this becomes the point of, again, continuing to refine these technologies that will be needed. 
but it also serves as the base camp from which the deep space transport spaceship will be built up, checked out, and eventually flown in phase two on a, a, a checkout mission or sometimes called a shakedown cruise where its systems will be evaluated, the performance of the systems incrementally uh, uh, improved, uh, you know, experience in the operation of that spacecraft as we get away from the proving ground and the safety of the deep space gateway. And that's critical to, to take us then into phase three where crews will begin expeditions to the Martian vicinity and eventually to the surface of Mars. And that's, the, that's the, the exciting thing that I see on the horizon. Um, it's this incremental buildup of capability, this phased approach to exploration that NASA has laid out. It's very logical. We recognize from ISS, we don't put a spacecraft in orbit, fire it up, and it works perfectly from day one. There's a lot to be learned. There's things to be wrung out in terms of how the systems operate. The gateway approach in the proving ground is exactly that model of how we will mature these technologies in a safe way, in a way that we have uh, the ability to return the crew on the robust lifeboat that is Orion. But again, we push the envelope on developing the spacecraft that's going to be needed for cislunar space uh, beyond cislunar. So just a little bit more about the gateway. And again, this is Boeing's deep space gateway concept. Uh, in the foreground, you see the power propulsion bus. This is a solar electric bus derived from our 702 satellite product line. It provides the basic power, uh, command and control, propulsion. Of course, it does all the attitude control, orbital maneuvers uh, where needed for the gateway. We show a docking node uh, in the middle there that is the expansion port that allows the flexibility uh, much as we had with ISS to build out the stack. Uh, when you think about that sequence, um, I think about the early missions on ISS. You know, remember the first flight of ISS was the FGB uh, Russian module, which was essentially the power propulsion module. We then launched the U.S. node, and, and again, that had limited command and control capability. Certainly didn't have the full range of habitat systems, but it became the building block from which we built out the station and then added the, the laboratory, which was the, the home of the crew. And that, and you can see the habitation module uh, there, you know, oriented toward the moon. All of the habitation systems needed to support the crew from a life support standpoint, waste and hygiene, galley, uh, all the crew interfaces eventually exercise so we can provide those countermeasures for longer duration stays at the gateway. We certainly intend the gateway to provide all that life support capability while Orion is there. Um, it's a goal to not have to deplete the Orion resources, but to rather have a gateway fully capable of supporting crews for 30 days, upwards of 40 days, and longer. Uh, those are important missions that, again, will allow us to gain experience with the systems and even do some science that it, of which there are tremendous opportunities in the orbit that the gateway will be in and the capability of the SET bus to do orbital transfers to a variety of orbits which would allow access to the lunar surface if such science missions are selected. And I know there's, there's plenty of conversation about that. And then you can see on top the airlock on the zenith location. So an airlock is an important feature. We feel strongly that we have the capability to do EVAs. We're not programming in EVA as a baseline capability, and there's not a hard requirement on the books from NASA to do EVAs, but we recognize, again, from the experience with ISS, the ability to maintain a spacecraft, the ability to address contingency situations as we had on ISS when we unfurled the arrays uh, early in the assembly sequence. Those are critical capabilities, and that's why an airlock is important. This airlock configuration is heavily derived from the ISS airlock. If you looked at the interior, you would see something very similar. Again, a high degree of reuse. There's no new technology involved in this. The crew lock is very similar. The hatches are similar. The depressed pump is similar. We intend to accommodate 
not just the USCMU, but potentially the Russian Orlan suit. A flexible airlock, again, highly derived from a U.S. Uh, ISIS configuration. These are the kind of things that we want to do at the gateways. Again, this is uh, evolutionary. It is taking existing technologies and reusing common systems, well understood systems, deploying those into cislunar at the gateway. There's a great opportunity to make this a very achievable, very affordable vehicle for cislunar space. Uh, we, you know, in talking about the contract itself, I, I think we've covered a lot of the objectives, but certainly this whole contract is about mitigating the critical risks for the next space, phase of human habitation. That's really what we all want to do here, is we want to tackle those hard problems. We want to get a hold of those big rocks and solve them. What are the things we need to solve? How can we get ahead on mitigating those risks? We can't go straight to Mars, uh, as we've said. We don't yet have that capability, so we need to go attack these risks, and we need to incrementally uh, build what's needed to get there. Our technical approach is to leverage uh, ISS technology, the experience we have, many of the assets that are uh, adaptable for this deep space gateway and beyond. Uh, as I mentioned, this power propulsion element, you know, our concept that uses the 702 satellite bus has 80 percent part commonality with the bus that we're flying today. Nearly 200 of these buses have flown successfully. Very strong, reliable platform to leverage for the power propulsion element. We also are concerned about getting experience from the standpoint of the crew interfaces and how we can augment that. Uh, we're using virtual reality and augmented reality to try to get an early understanding of these crew interfaces, what the crew will experience within the gateway. We're building a full-scale demonstrator, but it's not enough to just have a physical mock-up. We're augmenting it with these technologies that will allow that immersive experience for the crew. It's very exciting technology, and I think, again, it's part of buying down the risk. We do a lot of those human, effect, human factors evaluations and human inter interface activities pretty late in the game. We, you know, the design, in many cases, has already solidified. It's mature. We don't have the opportunity to, uh, to change things and optimize. That's one of the things that the virtual world will afford us. So, boy, I, I tell you, I would love to be on the deep space transport spaceship and see that view of Mars. It's got to be something that's, that would be an incredible inspiration just to imagine it. It's not going to be me, but it may be someone here in the audience. If you're thinking about getting on board and getting involved in human spaceflight, please do. This is exciting for our nation. What an incredible view that would be. Can you imagine seeing Mars, not in the movie The Martian, but real, in real life? That's what we want to go do. Let's get on board and go do it. Thank you. Well said, Mark. I actually saw this in the hotel last night. It's uh, the Mars generation and these kids getting to do something that I always wanted to do, which was go to space camp here. But I want to be in that picture. Those are way too young. Um, I think we're all the Mars generation. So good, well said, Mark. So as Jason said, uh, can we go to the next chart? As much as I love Boeing's uh, presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll go to mine. <laughs> OK, so as Jason said, uh, I'm Bill Pratt. I'm the program manager for Next Step at Lockheed. And um, again, just want to echo what the other panelists have said. I'm grateful to be here, grateful for the invitation from Jason and from the, the symposium. And uh, I, too, have to pinch myself every day that I get to work on such an exciting project and uh, with such an exciting group of engineers back home. Uh, it really is uh, kind of a unique opportunity to be able to, uh, to be a part of a new chapter in human spaceflight. And so I'm, uh, we're very grateful to take that journey with NASA. Um, here's sort of a family portrait of the Lockheed uh, Next Step concept. I can barely read it from here, so I'll try to crane my neck here. Um, here's the, the Orion spacecraft that uh, Lockheed we know and love very well. I'll talk a little bit more about how Orion is uh, an integral part of the, the deep space gateway. Uh, here we have uh, an EVA module uh, and then a, the core habitat module. And as part of the Next Step contract, this is uh, something that we are also building a, a prototype of. 
It, uh, it is going to be a refurbished multi-purpose logistics module that currently lives at the shuttle um, uh, support facility down at KSC. And we're refurbishing that actually. And that's kind of, um, as it's been mentioned, one of the, the guiding principles for us on our project is to try to reuse as much as possible existing technology to, to reduce costs and to get on orbit quickly. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, here we have, uh, oh great, how do I go back? Here we have a cargo logistics module. Uh, of course you need, you need cargo, you need logistics, you need to not only be able to bring those things up, but you also have to be able to dispose of those, uh, of those things when you're done. And then the power and propulsion module. Um, this, this spacecraft, uh, you know, also for us relies pretty heavily on our um, commercial heritage, but also on our uh, planetary spacecraft heritage. We uh, at Lockheed have a lot of experience operating spacecraft that spend years in deep space without much human interaction. And that's pretty akin to how we're gonna operate the gateway. If we, if we have one mission per year where astronauts are there for 30 or 60 days the rest of the year, the, uh, the gateway remains unoccupied. Not that it's not being used, um, that's where robotics come in and we, we use it to do science even when astronauts are not there. Uh, but it, it, it operates in a mode very similar to how we operate our deep space uh, planetary spacecraft. Here's what I like to call the uh, deep space gateway playground. Um, essentially, the, uh, the gateway is really all about buying down risk for going to Mars. Um, and we want to do that as quickly as possible. And so we, we start in cislunar space. The spacecraft is not uh, stationary, if you will. It, it will be able to travel to multiple destinations within cislunar space and will also be used to build up the deep space gateway um, or the deep space transport, sorry. And so when we do our architecture trades, we, we do have, you know, reference baseline architectures, but it's also important to make sure that you're building a gateway that's going to last for 10, 15, 20 plus years. And without knowing exactly what the mission sequence is, you have to be able to build in capabilities that will support classes of missions. So um, as we look at the kinds of things that we need to do or that astronauts need to do in order to, to get more uh, self-reliant, those are the types of things that we want to build into, um, into the Deep Space Gateway. And then we'll evolve from there. Uh, so we're at a university, so I think I'm okay showing a log-log plot. Um, <laughs> just to kind of nail, nail down, uh, or just to, to get a, across the point of why we need a Deep Space Gateway, um, this plot over here shows the, the duration, or this is sort of the sum total of human spaceflight knowledge right now. I don't have every, every mission up here, I've just pointed out some. But you've got uh, duration here on the y-axis and then distance from Earth here on the x-axis. And so you can see that in, in our experience in human spaceflight, we've got lots of experience on ISS with long duration missions, uh, even, even longer than a year if you, if you account, uh, include Mir. But we don't have a lot of experience with long durations at long distances. So the Apollo era, we have uh, several missions to, to the uh, lunar vicinity, but those were only for about uh, a week or a few days long. And so what it's going to take to get us all the way to Mars is to increase a thousandfold our distance and also double the duration. And so that's really what the Gateway is all about. It's about um, helping the astronauts become more self-reliant. Uh, I actually think astronauts may be uncomfortable with I, that idea of not having the ground being able to inter intervene and everything. Up here on the top, I've got sort of the, the round trip communication delay. So as we get further and further from Earth, uh, especially as we get to Mars, those interactions with the ground become less frequent and they become more delayed. And so astronauts really need to be able to have the self-reliance to um, as my boss puts it, stay and fight uh, in an emergency or to, to fix problems as they arise without a lot of interaction. And, uh, you know, just for um, comparison, the ISS takes over a thousand commands from the ground a day to keep it uh, running. And that's, that's a paradigm shift as we go towards cislunar space and the deep space gateway. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about self-reliance. So, um, 
the gateway, I think Bill Hill said it well yesterday, that the gateway by itself and the elements by itself are not human rated per se. Um, it's really, at least early on in the evolution of the gateway, we see Orion as providing that, um, that additional fault tolerance and, um, and fault management to be a safe haven really for the, for the gateway. And so the, uh, we can leverage Orion. If you, if you look at what it's going to take to go to Mars, we have to have a similar sort of paradigm. We have to be able to have a safe haven within our Mars transport system. This is a, a depiction of our Mars base camp uh, concept. And so really, when we're in cislunar space, we're practicing that safe haven capabilities right away. So early on, we uh, rely a lot on Orion's subsystems, including ECLIS, uh, potentially power, COM, and other things. And then we evolve from there to become uh, a more self-sufficient deep space gateway. But along, we're using those lessons learned that we get uh, on the gateway in those early phases to feed forward into Mars so that when astronauts have problems, they can use uh, Orion plus a small habitat volume as sort of a safe haven to, to uh, troubleshoot and fix problems. And here's just a, a little bit further depiction of some of the, the areas. We, we like to call Orion the, uh, the command deck. And so our approach is, is, again, to rely very heavily on Orion's capabilities. I've pointed out a few, a few of them here from from life support uh, up to uh, crew displays and controls. You can see here we have an astronaut that's using a, a wireless tablet as she floats through the tunnel from the EVA module into the HAB module. So we're looking for commonality wherever we can find it. And the, uh, the displays and controls that are currently being developed for Orion are sort of next, genera next generation, uh, next evolution of displays and controls, but not just the physical hardware, but also the, the displays and controls formats are really portable to, uh, to a, the next generation platform. And so while we do rely heavily on Orion at the beginning, as I said, we, we evolve from there. And we also bring in new emerging technologies, as it's been said before, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and the idea of a digital twin is something that really plays a uh, heavy importance for astronauts as they go into deep space. So the ability to, uh, to have a virtual or digital model of their own spacecraft, keep bumping into this thing, and to, uh, to be able to use that to troubleshoot problems as they arise is something that we see as, as very important. I think that's all I had. Yeah, I won't try to brief these. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Lindsay with Sierra Nevada Corporation. Um, looks like I'm the last one to go, so I'll... Uh, try to go shorter so that we, you guys can start uh, asking us questions. So that's what I'm most interested in today in is hearing your thoughts and your ideas as we create this. You know, all ideas are welcome and we got to go figure out how to do this as a group. Um, so uh, we're, uh, we're fortunate enough to be a, uh, a new entrant into this, uh, into the, uh, um, this program and we're really excited to be there. Um, so this is the, the contract that most of you are probably familiar with and a picture of uh, what our deep space gateway looks like. And we're uh, basically we're on contract where we just started the design phase uh, at Sierra Nevada, and so we're going through the design phase. Um, but it's going to culminate, as Jason mentioned, into uh, us building a full-size prototype, working prototype of the deep space gateway, basically at the architecture level. Uh, and you can see the elements on the chart here. First, uh, pro uh, power propulsion element that provides the... Uh, the power, uh, both for operating the vehicle and, uh, and transporting the vehicle. Habitat module, uh, as you can see, we're using an inflatable habitat module. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about why in a minute. Uh, a logistics module and, uh, and of course, an airlock. Um, not that we're specifically, like others have mentioned, designing to do spacewalks, but we know in contingency cases we're probably going to have to do that. Or you may want to go out and, for science reasons and do EVAs, but ideally if we design this robust, uh, have the ability to, uh, to for graceful de degradation and be able to uh, stay inside and repair this, that's obviously the, the, the optimal way to do it. Um, so, um, the, uh, but if you uh, come by our facility in about 18 months, you'll be able to see a, a full-size uh, prototype of this. Um, we just opened a new manufacturing facility uh, up in Louisville, where, in Colorado, where we're based. And we'll actually be building this uh, 
side by side with our Dream Chaser uh, cargo vehicle that'll be ongoing at the same time. So you'll be able to come up and see both side by side being built at the same time. Um, the, uh, just to give you an idea, our uh, habitat module is uh, 27 feet in diameter, and so it will be a large, uh, very impressive structure when we get done. Um, so we're basing our technology, like, like many others are, on, on things we already know, things we're already doing. Uh, and in fact, our logistics modules are based on the cargo modules that we're building for the Dream Chaser uh, cargo system uh, that uh, we're on contract to uh, provide missions to the ISS to deliver logistics back and forth. And so we're basing it on that. We're trying to make it uh, simple, and we're trying to make it modular in design for a number, a number of reasons. Um, this is kind of how we have it programmed right now, and again, we're working on this, and we'll change it as we uh, come up with uh, better ways of doing this. Um, but we're proposing a modular approach, obviously teamed uh, on co-sharing co on uh, SLS with Orion as we go out and build up this uh, cislunar gateway, starting with a power propulsion element and, and a single module uh, going up in the 2021 to 2023 timeframe. Uh, we'll follow that up uh, on the next one with the habitation module. Um, and if you notice, each time we're putting up a, uh, or on several of these missions, we're putting up 50 kilowatt uh, power propulsion elements, a uh, team with our partner, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. And we're going to build up a modular approach and do a build up approach uh, to this, uh, to this uh, gateway. Um, next, a logistics module and uh, and uh, providing additional power propulsion elements, and finally, in the end, getting up to 150 kilowatts and getting the rest of the elements there. Um, so we're, we're very much a modular approach, obviously using SLS, and and because uh, you know that's uh, provide the logistics to get out there to uh, to uh, cislunar space, which is difficult, takes a lot of energy to get there. Um, but this is what I really wanted to focus on. We've talked a lot about designs and how we're going to do this. Um, what I wanted to focus a little bit on, uh, Jason mentioned earlier, is the public-private partnership and the commercialization aspects of this. Um, obviously, our flagship program at SNC is a Dream Chaser program. The Dream Chaser is very suited to low Earth orbit. Uh, Dream Chaser is probably not something we're going to take to Mars or to the moon. Not really a good reason to take wings to the moon. Uh, but for low Earth orbit, we see it as the vehicle of the future and our flagship. And, and the other thing that we have to think about, I think, uh, as industry and, and, and as the agency is, ISS is an awesome platform, and we hope that it operates for a long, long time to come. But at some point in the future, when we do transition to this deep space uh, gateway, we're going to have to figure out how we transition low Earth orbit at the same time. Um, what we don't want to do is get in a budget situation like we faced in the 2000s where space shuttle program ended, we didn't have uh, an ability to get crew to the International Space Station, we end up in this gap period. So what, one of the things we're focused on commercially from our aspect in conjunction with this is how to do that graceful transition from ISS, whether ISS becomes a smaller ISS or a modified space station that stays up there or whether it's uh, done something else. because. We're still going to want access to low Earth orbit for commercialization purposes. NASA is going to want access for science purposes. And so to that end, what we focused on in our Deep Space Gateway is keeping an eye on commercialization and uh, because that's a big part of our business model and that's why we're doing what we're doing as well. And so as a result, we've designed uh, our, our, uh, our program here to be able to fly on multiple vehicles. For example, every one of our elements currently fits inside a five meter fairing. Now it's suited to SLS, designed for SLS and for the direct build, it will do that, but it also can be tested in low Earth orbit, can be tested on ISS, and can also fly on conventional rockets, uh, each of these elements, so that you have the ability to, to do either. With the advent of solar electric propulsion and technologies like that, you do have an opportunity, if you think about um, when you go out to uh, um, cislunar space and you bring crew out to cislunar space, there's a time and a time element which affects logistics. For example, if you're going to have humans out there for 40 days, it takes X amount of logistics. If you're going to have them out there for 1,000 days, it's a lot more logistics. So really, the key to, to crew getting at least a cislunar space is speed, and that's what you need SLS for. But 
if you're hauling up logistics, and let's say you're, you're limited on logistics, um, obviously on SLS they can carry a lot, but there's a limited number of missions you can do. But if you can launch those same logistics into low Earth orbit, you have time to affect on logistics. You can take a long time to get your logistics there if you get them ahead of the crew. So an option would be fly on conventional rockets, get your logistics into low Earth orbit, use something like solar electric propulsion to do a slow transition to cislunar space, and that's how you can enhance your logistics um, and be flexible using the commercial market to whatever's available to, to, uh, to, to get stuff there when you need to get stuff there. And so we're eyeing that, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, that. We're also, our, we're looking at our modular approach that um, some of our modules and the and things we're developing for this program may be applicable directly into low Earth orbit. You may be able to have common elements that work both in low Earth orbit and in cislunar space. And you have a, essentially common interfaces and a common way to uh, do science or whatever it is you need to do, both in cislunar space but also in low Earth orbit so that we keep low Earth orbit commercialization alive and well. And, and as NASA has asked, to have more commercial companies kind of take over that so that uh, we can provide services to NASA while they focus on exploration, which is everybody's long-term goal. Um, so I think that's probably uh, enough out of me for now because we really want to hear from you. And, uh, and uh, thank you very much. And we're, we're really privileged and excited to be a part of this program. Thank you. So with that, um, we do really want to encourage kind of audience questions. Um, so please, uh, Alan and Chris have mics there. Um, but more, oh, OK, we have some right off the bat. Morning, gentlemen. Uh, having had a background in both the bioastronautic side as well as constellation, I like the reuse. But the number one risk the human guys are still working on is radiation and the reuse of a lot of aluminum, which is one of the worst shielding materials for a protection of crew, seems to be a challenge. How do you intend to address the reuse of a lot of material and then insert that radiation protection once we get outside the Van Allen belts? I can try and take a credit. I'll start with that one. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and I think the question came over here. Uh, Metals are not that great at shielding against cosmic, uh, galactic cosmic rays. But one of the things that we look at in terms of the internal packaging, so we have, you know, obviously water and things that have a lot of high hydrogen content that need to be stored within the HAB modules. So we look at ways, uh, first of all, to use the things that we have. So can we position water? Uh, can we package that smartly inside the HAB module? Can we package crew supplies smartly within the HAB module too? And another exciting uh, sort of emerging technology that's been tested on space station is the reuse of plastics. So actually melting plastics down into tiles, if you will, that can be used to help with, uh, with radiation shielding. So we're looking at that too. So what are some ways that we can reuse, um, uh, you know, trash, if you will, or, or uh, stuff that would normally get thrown away and sent back? Uh, we also, uh, have partnerships with other companies looking at things like radiation vests or their personal protection garments that astronauts can can wear that can help them uh, stay protected against radiation too. GCRs are pretty hard to, uh, there's, there's not a whole lot you can do to protect against the GCRs, but the, uh, the solar flares are something that Orion has designed uh, from the get-go to be able to uh, be converted into a, a solar radiation shelter, so that's another option that uh, in the event of a solar flare, astronauts can use Orion as a, as a solar uh, flare shelter, basically, or storm shelter. Yeah, we've taken a look at some of the radiation concepts, and you're absolutely right. Um, although there are some emerging technological developments in metallic structures that are um, radiation resistant, we've got some intellectual property on that that we're looking at. The other thing is just the module layouts. When you think about where the crew spends most of their time, You've got to have a place for them such as the sleep quarters that's more centrally located. It's natural in these cylindrical modules for the crew to want to be sort of toward the pressure wall, and that's the, that's the worst place to be. And if you're employing a strategy to move, you know, clothing and waste materials out to the periphery of the module, you want those sleep stations 
more centrally located in the module. That's kind of what our concept has looked at as well. One thing to add from uh, our perspective, our uh, one of our uh, groups is uh, formerly known as Orbitech, and uh, they're for those who aren't familiar with them, one of the things they do is the the veggie experiment that's on space station. They built that. Well, we're looking at a concept called green wall technology, um, where we're essentially taking all of these. Uh, uh, we're assuming that you know to help close the ecless loop, we're going to have plants, uh, you know, generating not only food but for psychological purposes and also providing some oxygen back in the air to help close that cycle. What we're finding is that technology, if we wrap that around the outside of the, uh, of the module, we also get radiation protection from that. We're also looking at, obviously, taking trash, melting it down uh, in plastics and using that as well as radiation protection, but trying to use as much in situ resources that have dual purposes to protect for radiation as we possibly can, because again, logistics is going to be a big issue uh, for this uh, deep space habitat. I think that's Dennis. Yep. Uh, almost 30 years ago, I stood as a student at this university in front of a similar group of you right here, heard very similar stories, very similar plans, very similar architectures. Little difference because we've grown since then. Uh, we didn't go to the moon. That was called the Space Exploration Initiative. 2005, I worked very diligently on the vision for space exploration. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, the question I have today, I see these students here from UAH. I have gray hair now. I do not want them to have gray hair standing up in front of you asking why we haven't done this. What do you have as a sense of urgency? Because you're all going to get paychecks whether or not this happens. It's one thing I've learned over the past 30 years. How do we impart to you and the agency and the Congress a sense of urgency to actually make this happen rather than talk about it. You guys want to take it first? <laughs> <laughs> so so I'll, I'll start off and I'll let the folks here on the panel too. Um, so I think with a sense of urgency now is uh, one of the big differences that we, with their, as we were seeing, we have significant hardware inflow right now with heavy lift launch vehicles and capable uh, deep space crew capsules, but also a, a very large growing non-NASA space industry as well. Um, and so the, I would say that the, the space industrial base has been growing in part over the past 30 years to a point that we have a much more robust situation than we've ever had, and meaning that we're posed to actually go execute this now. And if we don't know what that next step is, um, a little bit of play on words here, but um, it, we need we need to be able to go out in a robust way, meaning that be able to survive different stakeholder objectives, meaning how do you go back to those eight principles, how do you design a, a sustainable program is destinations may change, scientific findings will change, technology will advance, so how do you design that system to go do that? And the first step is going out there. And we think there's a, we've got a solution with a gateway, and you see many different ways to implement gateway from many different types of companies here in doing that as the first step. It opens up uh, opportunities for utilization and exploitation of cislunar space, including the surface of the moon and then outwards towards Mars. Um, we believe we have the right architecture here and now we have an industry that's much more robust than that we had 30 years ago that's ready to go pose to do it. Um, now we just need the, the stakeholder engagement to continue for that to allow us to go do it. So, but I'll let my colleagues on the panel here. Well, add. you know, I think the public private partnership model helps to stimulate that sense of urgency. The public side of that is critical too. You all need to get involved. We need to fill this auditorium with folks that are enthusiastic and want to get involved, want to invest their time and their energy. Ask us the hard questions. You, you've got probably a lot more questions you could put us on the spot, but we need everyone to invest. You know, to me and those of us that have human spaceflight in our blood, this is inspirational to every day that we do this work and we think about these ideas. We need the public to get involved. Um, the public-private partnership you know, is a stimulus for us to try to bring commercial partners that may not be traditional aerospace companies into these, uh, um, in, in, engage them into these uh, opportunities and we're doing that to a large degree. So if I could add, um, one of your statements said, you know, 
you all have gray hair and if this doesn't go, you'll continue to get paid. I can assure you that at my company, that is not the case. <laughs> um, seriously, um, we're, you know, we're, we're part of the kind of the, it's not new space, but you know, we're, we're a fairly new entrant into human space flight and, and they, so it's particularly compared to my colleagues that have been involved for, you know, since space flight started. We're focused on trying to make this happen. I mentioned the commercialization, I mentioned the public-private partnership. To me, this is the key is that you have to build, and, and I'll stay away from the technical, you have to build a program that's sustainable, that has public support, as was mentioned, has, uh, has government support, has international support. We learned that from the space station. You know, space station almost got killed in the early 90s, and what's, I think what saved space station was the international piece of it. And uh, I think most people who know the history of space station knows that's why it's been successful. I think in the future we need that. It has to be, we have to have a compelling vision, we have to sell that vision, but we have to keep it sold internationally and, 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 and show that. Um, from a commercial perspective, we have to make this commercially viable, um, which means we have to look at ways to do it a lot cheaper than we're doing it today. We have to have commercial incentives, we have to have the ability to use this technology in a commercial way so that we can spin off and turn low Earth orbit commercial so that we can afford to do this exploration. The challenge will be is we can't afford, I know in the future we can't afford to do both. We can't expect government to do both. We can't expect NASA to be able to be funded to do both. So we have to capture that and we have to keep it sold. So that's, that's my take on how we do this. And that's what's different than 30 years ago. Yeah, I'll echo what, what both of these gentlemen have said um, and also agree that I, I don't feel like uh, we'll get a paycheck either. I don't think that's a, that's a lock for us. I also don't think that it's a lock, even though we have these great plans and we, we're presenting, uh, you know, what we think is the right path forward. I don't think that's a lock either. So, uh, you know, every day we work hard to engage the public, to engage uh, the folks that are uh, that are like-minded here in the room to try to build uh, to try to build that advocacy. One of the things that I think is uh, also really encouraging to me is to see the way again NASA has set up this public-private partnership. So I I see a lot in the eight strategic principles. I see a lot in the the desire to build up a set of capabilities that can survive. Hopefully multiple, uh, you know, administration changes or changes in direction. And so I, I feel encouraged uh, in the direction, the direction that NASA is going, that they've learned from some of those uh, past, you know, not necessarily mistakes, but um, losses, and really tried to, to roll that into the current thinking and, and looking forward. And Dennis, uh, one, one last comment here. We do have in recent times the objective evidence of CRS you know, being successful um, in creating a new capability very quickly and, and cost effectively. So if we can leverage that same formula again, you know, we're, we're certainly hopeful uh, at orbital ATK. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and with Nanorax's perspective, you know, the facilities we're trying to develop here with Ixion are ones we fully intend to develop as commercial LEO facilities. And we're actually, you know, talking with, you know, customers in various areas about, you know, putting these on the market as something that, you know, is an operational thing beyond just servicing NASA needs. Um, and I think that's one of the key challenges, you know, that's not easy, but if you can get to the point where you have a product that has commercial customers, where it's coming from, you know, where you're actually meeting needs of, you know, whether it's, you know, space tourism or, you know, or some of these other ones we've been looking at, um, you know, you have a profitable venture like that, and that means that that capability is going to persist whether or not there's NASA money coming into it at a given point in time. Um, and uh, on the technical side, the architecture we're picking is also one that, you know, gives a lot of uh, flexibility for, for, for moving around later, as I was mentioning. It's like we developed the LEO version of it, and the main difference between that and something that can eventually move out to, you know, different destinations is, you know, when the ASIS upper stage is developed, it's being designed to be refueled, and one extra one extra propellant load is enough to boost this thing out to cis lunar space. Two extra propellant loads and a Zeus kit is enough to land it on the lunar surface. 
Um, so that's ki so it's kind of a mix of the technical side of making something that you can prove out in Leo and then move elsewhere uh, down the road when you, you know, like, you know, say NASA changed its focus next week and wanted to say, no, we're going straight to Mars. You know, we'd still be developing, you know, we'd still be developing this as a commercial facility and we would still have that capability that the only difference uh, or the main difference between our LEO facility and one for, you know, for lunar orbit would basically just be another propellant load on, on the upper stage. Alex? Hi, uh, thank you all for your presentation. Um, Despite uh, the competitiveness between your different companies, do you work together? Uh, and if yes, how so? And if not, why not? <laughs> I'll do that one well, you guys. we do work together. Um, you probably would be surprised. Uh, Boeing is working with NanoRacks on developing a commercial airlock that will be flown to the International Space Station in 2019. And that's a partnership that brings in the commercialization opportunities and also looks at uh, exploitation of that capability for deep space. Uh, we're working with Lockheed, as a matter of fact, uh, on the next generation of docking system that will be uh, provided for Orion and for the Deep Space Gateway. Matter of fact, we have a team working together on that here in Huntsville this week. So we collaborate uh, in a number of areas. I think, though, that to your point, there are more opportunities that we should try to take advantage of and we should try to, to reach out more. Uh, I think that's definitely a, a source of opportunity that would benefit NASA. So this is a great question. I was asked this question on a Comic-Con panel once and I was sitting next to Boeing <laughs> and I said, uh, Lockheed is sort of like the rebels and Boeing is more like the empire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't but, know if I that. <laughs> Yeah, Matt, Matt liked that I was going to flip it. <laughs> uh, but no, but it, seriously, Mark's right. Um, and, and I would like to also say that competition is a good thing. Um, I think all of us make each other better. And so as we move through this, this phase of competition, it's, it's, it's a good thing. And I think as taxpayers, we would want that. Uh, we would want that, the competition to drive out the best in, in all of us, and I think, uh, you know, when I look forward to uh, not just the gateway, but also to the deep space transport and going to Mars, um, there's lots of room for people who aren't even on this panel right now. So I, I think that there's, uh, you know, I see the opportunities going this way, not going this way, and so there's, there's lots out there, I think, for, for us to collaborate on and for us to, to uh, compete on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just going back to a point I made earlier, you know, with NanoRacks, you know, we're very, uh, you know, we try to be a very collaborative uh, group, you know, um, yeah, uh, uh, like with the collaborations on the airlock with, uh, with Boeing and on some of the other platforms we've been developing. Um, but, you know, going back to what I was saying, um, we really, you know, we really want our facility to be something that's commercially viable, that's developed in a way that, developed to commercial requirements. And a good way of being able to do that is to partner with, or is, you know, developing systems in, you know, in collaboration with, you know, with other groups as well. Um, I guess, you know, just giving an example, it's like, you know, we need a, you know, mission module for our facility and we've got a, you know, design that we're, you know, that we're doing that would be, you know, very commercially focused. Um, but we could also partner with any of the other groups that are doing these habitats, you know, to also provide some of those uh, mission module functionalities because you know, especially when you start looking at the kind of requirements you need reliability wise out at the moon versus for a low earth orbit commercial facility, there may be some real benefits to, you know, kind of, you know, kind of splitting that a little bit where, um, uh, and j just to use an analogy with, uh, how Surrey Satellite in the past has done uh, small satellites. When they launch a small satellite, they tend to have, um, they almost, they're often flying like two sets of systems. One that's a legacy flight proven system and one that's a new you know, commercial off the shelf system that they're trying to see if it'll work in that environment. And so they'll, they'll run both of them. They have the heritage system as the backup and they've got the new you know, lower cost commercial system that they're trying out. So you get the benefits of you know, dissimilar redundancy and of, of having that legacy system while also being able to prove out the commercial parts um, you know, in a way where failure is an option 
on some of the systems because you know when failure is not an option, you know success becomes really expensive. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do is you know figure out like going forward, you know what's the best way of you know splitting that up. And I think that collaboration actually has you know some real um, enables some real opportunities there for you know making a deep space gateway that also you know has a commercial element you know that you know that doesn't um, you know you know that's still commercially viable for other applications beyond NASA. So NASA doesn't have to like cover the whole cost of uh, of, of development and you know sustaining operations and stuff. So I'll, I'll give you one last statement to kind of close out this question and it, and it's part of our next step efforts and actually with our international partners as well. We are developing a whole set of interoperability standards um, across all the different discipline systems and that allows us to have a commonality across global companies, not just domestically, but with our international partners, um, to foster actually quite a bit of competition. So um, uh, regardless of who builds a system, it'll, it'll be interoperable with somebody else. Um, that's, that is the basis of our international docking standard, and you see um, actually two uh, companies working together on a NASA docking system for that, um, building to the same international standard. But now we need to expand that beyond docking. Um, to everything from avionics to atmospheres to, to power quality and a whole host of other areas that we're uh, approaching with, with it as well. So, Chris, up over in the top. Uh, so this is a two-part question. First part is to continue on the gentleman in front that talked about we haven't really made this happen in 30 years uh, to the, the companies that are held by uh, private shareholders and uh, public shareholders. Will you continue this effort if the funding from the government gets cut for some reason? Uh, and continue to build it. And the uh, second part of that question is, um, if that happens, would you partner up with a, a private company that isn't so influenced by government politics and uh, continue forward? Sounds like a lot of questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll summarize it for you, but it's really for you guys. I think um, I had a hard time. Yes, yeah, so I think I heard the question as um, uh, if if the funding were for this going, ends tomorrow, um, and I'm not sure the, how proud of it this is, but uh, for next step, I'm going to assume, would you guys still continue on, and then um, and would you partner with companies that aren't um, directly tied to a, a government contract mm -hmm. only? Um, um, and one of the things that I, I like to say about next step is when we originally thought about this, I, maybe naively we thought. How do we go achieve a gateway type thing, habitats in deep space, while trying to encourage low Earth orbit uh, commercial activities to occur? What's turned out is, uh, as we've gone through the multiple stages we've already done with these companies, is that how companies approach how they contribute their in-kind <coughs> portion of the work that they're doing is a fundamental uh, is fundamentally different by company, and it's also delineated by the product lines that they have that are outside of just this contract. Um, so it's, when you say continue things, is will companies continue to be commercial satellite providers? Will companies continue to do deep space scientific missions? And then will con companies continue on LEO uh, exploitation or, or commercial activities as well? There's, there's many different ways that activities that they're contributing under Next Step will continue. And it's not just in the, in the generation of a habitat for deep space. Um, so I'll, I'll set that up as a starter for you guys, but yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for the question. So, you know, without getting too specific into things that we're looking at, you know, we're always looking at um, new technologies, partnerships, always evaluating. I would say at this stage in the, the Deep Space Gateway, it's pretty early. So I think there's a lot of possibility for all sorts of directions it could go. Um, I think in terms of Others that may not be uh, politically motivated are still have to be motivated by market forces. So uh, there has to be a market for the kinds of things that we build. I mean, we are a publicly traded company after all. So I would say if NASA were to somehow go away as an anchor tenant of the Deep Space Gateway, uh, we would look for alternate sources of, uh, of customers and, and, and we would just have to look and see if that makes sense, if the market could still support that. I think uh, it was said yesterday at, at the luncheon by uh, Bill Gersenmeyer that NASA really sees themselves as the anchor tenant of CIS Lunar in the beginning. 
And I couldn't agree with that more. I think while right now uh, NASA is sort of the sole customer for a deep space gateway, I hope that that's not always the case. I hope that by building this infrastructure and this platform to support cislunar operations that we could actually, uh, NASA can actually foster a market in terms of uh, whether it's mining asteroids, mining on the moon, or resource extraction um, for a water-based economy for propellant um, in particular. Uh, I hope that those are the kinds of things that come, that come out of it. We'll just have to see, but uh, yeah. Good question. Yeah, from, from, from our perspective, um, first of all, we are a private company. We don't have any shareholders. And so our company has always been focused in a much longer term view. And uh, since our decision makers are two owners, um, they, uh, they see you know what we're doing in space as a strategic investment that they've really, really focused on. So that's where we started from. And in fact, when we started uh, our Dream Chaser program, we uh, we started out with nothing from NASA. What we did is we uh, we actually went to NASA and created the first, what I call a reverse space act agreement, um, which basically meant we wanted to establish an agreement with NASA where we would actually pay them to help us, and that's how we that's how we started Dream Chaser, and uh, it's it's evolved to where it is today. So we're focused on that. But uh, you know, to that point, for Deep Space Gateway in the future, if NASA were to go away as the anchor tenant, then we, we, you know, we'd have to look at the business case, whether or not we continue that, whether there's other people that want to go do that, uh, anchor tenants, and whether it's there. But, you know, the whole point of this uh, public-private partnership, particularly in low Earth orbit, is to sh eventually shift to the point where NASA is no longer the anchor tenant like they are on space station today, um, and uh, so that we can commercialize that. And quite frankly, from our company, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we did not believe that we could shift who's the anchor tenant in low Earth orbit as that piece of it, and so so that NASA can focus on exploration, uh, which is where we all really want to go. Those of us have been in NASA, and I, I spent 16 years at NASA. We've always wanted to go explore, and hopefully we'll get to do that now. Yeah, um, as the other you know pr smallest and you know privately held uh, company here. Um, you know, Nanorax has done a lot of work with, you know, actually raising private equity to go after some of the projects that they've been doing, like the, um, like the airlock, uh, the external platform, some of these other things are ones that we've actually gone out to the market and raised money for. Um, you know, as far as, you know, a deep space gateway, um, you know, like like the other side, we'd have to we'd have to have a business case for that. Uh, the the good thing, once again, you know, pulling it back is with our stuff. Um, since we're looking at uh, you know at Leo facilities, Leo you know Leo space stations, you know post you know both augmenting ISS while it's still here and then post ISS, um, there is a lot more you know near term viable market interest that we're seeing in that area that. Um, that I think that there is a good probability that we'd be able to raise the money and go after and actually build and operate LEO facilities. Um, the, the, further, the ones further out in lunar orbit and such, uh, that definitely is going to take more work. Um, without, I mean, you know, NASA is a huge enabler here. Um, you know, if, if the next steps program was to go away tomorrow, it would definitely slow things down. But, you know, we are seeing real markets that we could go after, raise real money for, and execute on. Um, you know, at least in the, at least in Leo in the near term, and you know, as Jeff uh, Jeff Member likes putting it, you know, when he was talking about you know Mars and the Moon, he said you know Mars is, I think he said Mars is in our hearts, Moon is in our business plan, um, fairly further out in the business plan than Leo, but it's still uh, but it's still there. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I we we definitely appreciate the you know, what NASA's doing here with Next Steps and how it's enabling things to move a lot faster than we could do purely on our own. Um, you know, I yeah, it'd be a lot slower going getting all the way out to the moon, you know, without NASA as an anchor tenant. But I think it'll get there eventually, especially if we can, you know, get a commercial foothold, you know, in low Earth orbit first. But, um, yeah. Hi there. To tie in the opening remarks, how do you balance the need to have a high um, 
high level of safety while still maintaining a certain degree of risk tolerance um, that I think is somewhat critical to um, fostering innovative solutions. So Jason alluded to a discussion uh, that NASA is stimulating relative to requirement innovation about a human safe gateway and habitat versus a traditional human rated in the, in the traditional paradigm of human rating of space vehicles. And when we think about the gateway as an intermittently tended vehicle and when we think about the, the, you know, the ability to return to Earth on the lifeboat that is Orion, a very capable system, you know, I, I certainly think we should look hard at the requirements that we're applying to the gateway in terms of reliability and failure tolerance and so forth because as we spec these things out, we can overspec it to the point where it becomes unmanageable, unaffordable, and we, and we, you know, we build in more capability than is needed for the mission uh, at hand, which for this vehicle, again, is not a permanently manned habitat the way ISS is or permanently crewed. So we've got to look hard at those requirements because those will influence everything from the timeline to develop it to the complexity of operation for the vehicle uh, to the amount of human involvement uh, while the crew is there. I think though too having the lifeboat means that while we're thinking about this concept of operations of the gateway, we should try to allocate the uh, support for the human tended operations to the gateway function itself. You don't have a lifeboat with a supply of food and water and medical equipment and life jackets and then deplete those resources as you go. We should think about the gateway providing all those services, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have the mission critical and the, the levels of redundancy that are needed. Uh, single failure tolerance systems from command and control and, and in other areas are, are plausible. Uh, the Orion, again, serves as the lifeboat. So we've got to challenge our, our thinking about traditional human rating requirements and, and really attack that because I think it's a source of, of uh, as I say, complexity and, uh, and even cost for the development. So I think um, I was, I'll have one last comment to kind of wrap up the panel for your question there. Um, and uh, it's but we're, as we're approaching doing the power propulsion element, we just issued, uh, we will be issuing contracts, obviously, for the power propulsion element. One of the key things we were asking industry was to respond about human rating requirements and the differences that you hear there. Uh, one of our biggest fears is you have commercial communication satellites, other satellite systems that have been operating in space 15 to 20 years, 20, 200 spacecraft um, with very low anomaly rates of those. Um, if we approach human rating of something like a geocommunication satellite, we could actually inherently lose, lose that reliability that's actually already flight proven. So that's another factor we're trying to figure out is how to balance that approach. I mean, of in the past, most human rated systems we don't have much flight data on. However, when you start utilizing high flight rate systems as part of your human rated uh, system that you have, um, you now have experimental, experiential data that may far exceed, exceed any normal reliability data that we uh, would typically have for a human system. So that's the balance we're striking with the power prop element specifically, is because there are there is a huge amount of flight heritage from many of the firms that are up here and others um, that we don't want to actually undo that flight heritage. And then, then allows us to uh, basically enable us to use commercial-like practices with, with data sets that actually support the, le the levels we need for reliability for human, human space flight. Um, so that's the balance we're trying to strike um, with the gateway kind of analogy of how we put the how, how we put that together along with Orion being there. Um, so this is probably one of the best questions. So if there are, this is interesting area for research, I think, for students as well in the audience of how do we think about human spaceflight, human rating uh, parameters and styles in the future as we go into these far off systems. We no longer have the ability to return to Earth um, when there's lack of abort scenarios. I think our paradigm needs to change quite a bit. So thank you guys. Thanks. I want to thank the panel and everybody here and your guys' questions. Okay. Thank, thank you, panel. Uh, so everybody, you can now turn your phone, uh, the volume up a little bit, and I want you to put your alarm on for 10 minutes or 10 o'clock, 14 minutes. Have your alarm on. If you don't set your alarm, listen to somebody else because we want you back in here for the next panel. You are now on a break generously supplied by Teledon Brown Engineering.
Uh, so enjoy, come back in here, and let's get started at 10.15.